my presentation has the title of Ahmed Abudoglu's Geopolitical Perception of Perceptions of All Cyprus. Uh, Ahmed Abudoglu's principal academic work, so-called strategic depth, strategic derindic, Turkey, which means strategic uh, depth, Turkey's position in the international arena, international <coughs> scene, which advocates a strategy that would put Turkey's Ottoman <coughs> in the priority of the Turkish foreign policy, the outline, <coughs> okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, which advocates a strategy that would put Turkey's Ottoman past in the priority of the Turkish foreign policy, outlines his perceptions and epitomizes his geopolitical vision of the current strategic decisions in the Turkish foreign policy. In fact, this academic work indicates the way he perceives the world. As he writes, the feeling of flow in history is what excites him most and accordingly losing that feeling is what he fears most. An innate ability to stop warring parties is what he desires in a superpower. There is no virtue without modesty, no honor without self-confidence and greatness. <coughs> if we have the ability to realize a problem, we have the ability to solve it as well. One of the basic guidelines of the Budoglu's foreign policy is the strong effort to deepen Turkey's relations with the Middle East, which according to the Turkish foreign minister is linked to a shared disappointment alongside the leadership of the ruling Justice and Development Party with the EU's decision to accept Cyprus into membership in 2004. Davudoglu continued to criticize the EU on the basis of that decision. Davudoglu strongly believes that this obstacle is used by EU leaders that are reluctant to accept <coughs> Turkey as a member. The purpose of my presentation is to analyze, first, the ongoing transition of the Turkish foreign policy from Europeanization to Euro-Asianism, under, of course, under Davudoglu. And second, to analyze his geopolitical perceptions about Cyprus within the context of the strategic depth. This presentation argues that Turkish foreign policy in the post-Cold War period may be conceptualized in terms of three distinct phases. First, an initial wave of foreign policy activism in the immediate post-Cold War context. Second, a new or second wave of foreign policy activism during the Justice and Development Party government with a strong emphasis on Europeanization. And third, the current tension between Europeanization and Eurasianism here I have to make a point for methodological purposes. I use the term, the terms Europeanization and Eurasianism. I adopted actually and borrowed these terms from a distinct uh, a Turkish academic, Professor Ziya Unis, who was the first one to use these terms. Although I disagree with the term Eurasianism, I use the term, I know the term Neo Ottomanism, but since these terms gained wide currency in the last few months after uh, Davudur was appointed as foreign minister. I, I follow the path of the wider community, of, uh, the, of the wider academic community of international relations. The roots of the second wave of activism can, in fact, be traced to the pre AKP era, to the crucial Helsinki decision of 1999 on Turkey's EU candidacy and the reforms undertaken by the coalition government of 1999-2002, particularly in the aftermath of the deep financial crisis of 2001. However, the ruling party, the Justin Development Party era uh, itself, has not been homogeneous in terms of foreign policy behavior. And I want to stress from the beginning. The central contention of this work is that there is no considerable continuity in terms of foreign policy activism and a multilateral approach to policy making during the AKP era. Yet, at the same time, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> yet at the same time, a certain discontinuity or rupture may be identified towards the middle of the first AKP government, signifying shift from a commitment to deep Europeanization to loose Europeanization and a parallel shift <coughs> to what may be classified as 
Euro-Asianism or soft Euro-Asianism, as Professor Ziaonis used the term. The American academic and strategic Spigliu Brzezinski portrayed Eurasia as a grand chessboard where both regional and global actors compete arduously to enhance their geostrategic and economic interests. Turkey, according to Davudoglu, is clearly a pivotal country and not a regional one. Uh, and here lies one of the most fundamental principles, one of the most fundamental perceptions uh, that would be raised on the political agenda of the Turkish foreign policy. Turkey is not a regional country. Turkey is a central country, it's a pivotal country, which tries to reconcile its long-lasting and Kemalist-inspired European orientation with a countervailing turn <coughs> towards Eurasianism. Moreover, there are significant tensions on the domestic front in trying to balance different components of its identity, cultural, geographical, historical, and strategic factors, as well as in struggling to consolidate democracy while preserving secularism in a predominantly Muslim society. The critical equilibrium which will emerge on both fronts and the interaction of these domestic and international factors will also ultimately determine the path of the new wave of activism in Turkish foreign policy. This multidimensional approach to foreign policy was very much influenced, as I said, by Ahmed Davudoglu's strategic depth perspective. Foreign policy is perceived no longer as a series of bilateral relations of foreign policy moves, but as a series of mutually reinforcing and interlocking processes. In this respect, Ahmed Davudoglu argues that in order to formulate a long-lasting strategic perspective, one needs to take into account historical depth, which provides a sound assessment of the links between the past, present, and the future, as well as a geographical depth penetrating into the intricate dynamics of the relations between domestic, regional, very important for the Udoglu, <coughs> regional factors, uh, global factors. This is something new that appears in Turkish foreign policy on, on, on a macro strategic level. The geocultural, geopolitical, and geoeconomic factors that contribute to the strategic depth of a country could only be genuinely interpreted at the intersection of these historical and geographic paradigms. Moreover, making an analogy of a bow and an arrow, Davudoglu argues that the further Turkey strains its bow in Asia, the more distant and precise will its arrow extend into Europe. Therefore, he states that if Turkey does not have a solid stance in Asia, it would have very limited chances with the European Union. The major premise of this argument is that Turkey is a central country. Again, I'm repeating this term, which is very important. It's a central country strategically located in the core of the Afro-Eurasian landmass. Hence, Turkey has multiple regional identities that cannot be reduced to one unified character or a single region necessitating it to extend its influence simultaneously to Europe, the Middle East, Balkans, the Black Sea, Caucasus, Central Asia, the, Cosp the Caspian, and the Mediterranean. As such, it also needs to go beyond a parochial approach to national security and to become a security and stability provider for its neighboring regions. And here lies another important issue that differentiates the Buddhist views about the traditional Kemalist perception about security. Consequently, Turkey's engagements from Central Asia to Africa, from the European Union to the organization of the Islamic Conference, and this is a very critical point, as well as its UN Security Council membership and quest for becoming a key player in regional energy politics are all part of this new foreign policy vision which, while somewhat maintaining Turkey's traditional Western orientation, has a strong Eurasian and Middle East component. In the context of this much more proactive approach towards the Middle East and Eurasia, an attempt is made to develop friendly relations 
with the Arab world. A major move in this regard is to participate and play a leadership role in the organization of the Islamic Conference. And this is nowadays the most interesting parameter of the Budogus foreign policy, taking into account the ongoing developments vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the effort of Turkey to strengthen in her relations with the Arab world and the worsening of the Israeli-Turkish travel. But this is something that uh, Baron Riel will speak later on, who knows very well uh, the, the case, I'm sure, of this. The AKPS Islamist roots in, roots in this context, context constitute an asset. The crucial March 1st decision not to allow US troops through Turkish territory during the March 2003 invasion of Iraq and Turkey's EU membership drive generates considerable interest in the Arab world. This is developing into a kind of rapprochement between Turkey and the Arab world, as I said before. There has also been a strong, but at the same time, a more pragmatic drive to develop diplomatic and economic relations with Russia and the rest of the, of the former Soviet Union. And this is another critical step that Budo Group has undertaken. There are significant efforts to revive the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Project, uh, something that, uh, uh, a project that is an ongoing one and I think uh, it will enhance tremendously Turkey's abilities to develop a new diplomacy in the Black Sea. Relations with Russia uh, are by and especially since Putin became, became the president. The role of Turkey as an important energy corridor is being develop, developed further and a number of, co of concrete steps are being taken in this direction, building on the achievements of the previous decade. On the one hand, Turkey has substantial dependency on Russian natural gas for its domestic consumption, leading to cooperation in major joint energy projects such as Blue Stream. On the other hand, the push towards turning Turkey into a major energy hub as a transit country has increased competition with Russia over energy issues as clearly re revealed by, by the Russian opposition to Babuche Han pipeline project, strongly backed by the United States. Now I'm coming to the point that I raised before um, about the loss of momentum of the Europeanization drive and how the concept of Euro-Asianism gathered momentum in Turkish foreign policy. In analyzing Turkey-EU relations during the AKP era, we may identify two distinct sub-phases. The first phase from the end of 2002 to roughly the end of 2005 corresponds to the golden age of Europeanization of Turkey. During this period, the AKP government built on the foundations laid by the previous coalition government and pushed single-mindedly for Turkey's full membership and the associated set of economic and democratization reforms. These there appears to be a significant degree of continuity with respect to foreign policy activism during the post-2005 era. Yet, the second subphase corresponds to a certain loss of enthusiasm and commitment on the part of the government to what was previously the focal point of Turkish foreign policy efforts, namely joining the EU as a full, as a full member. Indeed, one may go further and argue that the foreign policy stance for the AKP government in the post-2005 era deviated from an all-out Europeanization drive to a possible retreat to what could be described as a kind of loose Europeanization or Eurasianism strategy. Now, Eurasianism or soft Eurasianism in this context does not refer simply to shift of foreign policy orientation in a direction focusing more on the former Soviet space in the Middle East. Rather, it means that foreign policy activism is pursued with respect to all neighboring regions, but with no firm EU axis, as was previously the case. What makes it distinct 
from heart Eurasianism, and again, I'm using these terms that gain, gain international moment, momentum among academics, international relations, is that the Western orientation and the Atlanticist element of Turkish foreign policy continues, but in a looser and more flexible form. To an outside observer, the loss of enthusiasm for the EU membership project in Turkey, both on the part of the government and the public at large, within a short space of time, represents quite a paradox and deserves an explanation. Indeed, there was no single turning point, but several interrelated turning points and a number of factors were, were at work to bring about this traumatic change of mood, both on the part of the AKP elite as well as the public at large. Now, let me come to some concluding remark, remarks regarding the first uh, point I want, I want to analyze in my presentation. The new wave of foreign policy activism during the justice uh, and development era, a party era, has started out with a strong emphasis on Europeanization. However, the AKP era itself displays elements of continuity and change in terms of foreign policy behavior. The central thesis of this presentation is that there is a significant continuity in terms of a proactive and a multilateral approach to policy making. Yet one is able to detect a certain rupture after the early years of the AKP government. Then this continuity is marked by a shift from uh, a commitment to deep Europeanization, to loose Europeanization, and a simultaneous shift to Eurasianism. What we increasingly observe in the current era is the emergence of an implicit, broad, and mutually reinforcing coalition of special partnership, which seems to be deeply rooted both in the European and Turkish context. This constitutes a significant danger from the point of Turkey's full membership prospects. The proponents of Turkish membership, both at home and abroad appear to be increasingly less vocal and enthusiastic compared to their Turco-skeptic and Euro-skeptic counterparts. The retreat of Euro-Asianism certainly does not signify the abandonment of the Europeanization project altogether. What it means, however, is that the EU will no longer be the center stage, the center stage of Turkey's external relations or foreign policy efforts. This, in turn, is likely to have dramatic repercussions for depth and intensity of the political reforms process in Turkey, especially in key areas, such as a complete reordering of military-civilian relations, an extension of minority rights, and a democratic solution to the, to the Kurdish problem. There is no doubt that there, exists a key, that, that there exist key elements within the Turkish state and Turkish society which would be quite content with the loose Europeanization solution given the, per the perceived threats posed by a combination on deep, of deep Europeanization and deep democratization for national sovereignty and political stability in Turkey. The fears of deep, deep, of deep Europeanization are not simply confined to the defensive nationalist camp. There also exists considerable conservatism, even in the much more globally oriented AKP circles, when it comes to deep democratization agenda. Another final question to be raised in this context is whether the retreat to lose Europeanization and uh, to Euro-Asianism is likely to be reversed. The likelihood of a major reversal in the immediate term appears to be rather low. For some Turkish analysts, there are developments, however, which create room for optimism. For instance, the change of government in the Republic of Cyprus, I'm transferring because of Turkish analysts, the change of government in the Republic of Cyprus followed by the decision taken on the part of the leaders of, the, of both communities to restart negotiations in the direction of reunification suggests that there is a possibility of a peaceful solution of the Cyprus conflict. 
Such progress may help to clear away perhaps the major hurdle on the part of Turkey's EU membership. Moreover, from a longer term perspective, two possibly mutually reinforcing developments may facilitate a renewed impetus to the deep Europeanization agenda. The first element of such a scenario would, il would involve a new enlargement wave in Europe which would incorporate the Balkans and Eastern Europe. And they believe, the Turkish analysts, that Turkey as a country which has already reached the point of accession negotiations will be immune to such a process. And this is something that Davoudoglu uh, shares. This brings us to the second part. How within this context of Eurasianism, that is an ongoing process, the Turkish foreign policy, Ahmed Davoudoglu perceives Cyprus. And my analysis, the second part, lies on the classical approach of geopolitics. When I use the term geopolitics, in this context, I mean the practice of using political power over a given territory. This is a classical approach of geopolitics. Davud Oglu, in his book, Strategic Death, does not leave the slightest doubt on the way he perceives Cyprus in geostrategic terms. He starts from the point that both Greek and Cypriot plans over the bicommunal bi-zonal federation as a solution to the problem are nothing but Greek maneuvers and hot air. This is what he writes in his book, published in 2001. Hopefully, in a few weeks, will come out in Greek. For Davut Oglu, Ankara has already defined a serious, coherent, and strategically cemented policy over Cyprus, and Cyprus is an indispensable, indispensable accessory of the Turkish geostrategy. In page uh, 175, there is a chapter, Cyprus, the Gordian Knot, Gordios Desmos, the Gordian Knot of uh, the Turkish foreign policy. In page 175, he writes, Cyprus, is situated in a central position in the global continent. Cyprus lies in equal distance from Europe, Asia, and Africa, and along with Crete is situated in a line that intersects the routes of sea circulation and transportation. Also, Cyprus holds a position between, from one side, the straits that separate Europe and Asia, and from the other side, the Suez Canal, that separates Asia and Africa. At the same time, Cyprus holds a geostrategical position of a strong base and an aircraft carrier that easily detects the development of the sea routes of Aden and Hormuz, along with the basins of the Gulf and Caspian Sea, which remain the most important connecting bridges of Eurasia and Africa. This is how he explains the importance, the geostrategic importance of Cyprus within the context of Eurasianism. In page 176, he raises the question rhetorically and he answers it. What, cap, what, happen, what happens if a country ignores Cyprus? He writes, a country that ignores Cyprus can never be active in the international and regional policies. It can never be active in the international arena since that small island has a geographical position that may affect directly the strategic connections between Asia, Africa, Europe and Africa, and Europe and Asia. He continues, also, a country that ignores Cyprus can never be active in regional be active and effective in regional policies since Cyprus lies with her eastern nose like an arrow turning to the Middle East, whereas her western back forms the foundation stone 
of the strategic balances that exist in Eastern Mediterranean, in the Balkans, and Northern Africa. I'm translating the page 178. Hamed Dabudoglu advocates the idea that Cyprus should remain out of the so-called Greek-Turkish strategic equation. Indirectly, he cites the, his vision about the solution of the problem. Because of Cyprus' geostrategic position, as he writes, Turkey is affected by a variety of balances, and that's why he's obliged to evaluate her Cypriot policy by separating the island from the Greco-Turkish equilibrium. Cyprus, as he writes, continues, Cyprus is becoming an issue of Eurasia and the Middle East from, the, from, from one side and the Balkans from the other side with a fast track. Turkey's Cypriot policy has to be placed in a new strategic context so that to apply with his new strategic context. He continues by writing the importance of Cyprus from from the Turkish perspective can be defined in two main directions. The first is the one of human value oriented towards strengthening the security of the Muslim Turkish community of Cyprus as a matter of the historical responsibility of Turkey. And I use the term Muslim Turkish community of Cyprus because he used this term. He continues explaining the importance of the security of the Muslim Turkish community by giving examples of geostrategic behavior that Turkey must adopt. A possible weakness of Turkey to protect the Turkish community of Cyprus may spread like a giant wave toward Western Thrace and Bulgaria, and even more in Azerbaijan and Bosnia. The second important axis of the Turkish policy in Cyprus is the importance of the island in geostrategic terms. And he writes, and I'm translating verbatim, even if there had not been, even if there had not been any Muslim Turkish in Cyprus, Turkey should have been obliged to invent the Cyprus issue. No country can remain mindless in such an island that lies in the heart of its living space. So just strategically, Ahmed Abudoglu, once he explained before the Turkish Lebensraum, Turkish living place, he extends his views about <coughs> several uh, territories around Turkey. And he explains why these territories are important for Turkey's living space.